This is Mara and Ben for Stellar Strategy Gaming, and today we're going to talk about two of people's most and least favorite classes, usually depending on whether or not you're playing it at that moment, which is the <laughs> Warlock and the Paladin. Yes, and I actually love the Warlock immensely. They're, they're probably, war, between Warlock and Sorcerer are my, are my two favorite classes. And so with, with Warlock... It, it, it always is sort of a shame when you have to criticize something you love, but even I recognize that there are some serious flaws with it, especially the uh, feet, the cantrip Eldritch Blast that just, that that one sentence basically sums up everything that's wrong with the class without and really having to explain more, but we will. So uh, expanding on that just a little bit, while you can be incredibly creative with a warlock, at the same time, the prevalence of Eldritch Blast in nearly every invocation that people actually take means that you're effectively only casting one cantrip, and it's the same cantrip, and it's an overpowered cantrip, and there's no variation at all. Like, how cool would it be if you took Warlock of the Celestial and you got radiant damage instead of freaking uh, force damage, or you took the Pact of the Great Old One and you did psychic damage, things like that, you know? But, but instead, we just, we have this, okay, I use Eldritch Blast. Okay, I use Eldritch Blast. And there's no resistance to force damage either, so there's no really, there's no real tempering it at all. Yes, very few creatures in the Monster Manual or any of the other books have force damage resistance. You know, one of my favorite characters that I ever, ever played was a Tiefling Hexblade Warlock and... One of the things I liked about him is that as a Hexblade, he had additional combat, frontline combat abilities, and he was packed with the blade, so I was kind of all in with making this a frontline warlock. But what I found is that even with his bonuses, with the Hexblade abilities to hand-to-hand -hand combat, to martial melee combat, mechanically, unless you've got some pretty serious magical weapons or something like that, it just makes more sense to use Eldritch Blast over everything else. At the, if I'm not wrong, at the same level where you can take uh, the, I believe it's Thirsting Blade that gives you an extra attack, is also where Eldritch Blast splits up into doing two bolts of damage instead of just one. So, so even at that point, like the Eldritch Blast, even as other abilities level up, the Eldritch Blast keeps up and. A couple of things on that one, I would really have appreciated it had they just made a little bit more diversity. I get it that it's a cantrip-based class, but they didn't have to have, there's something like three or four of the Pact Boons where you, uh, I don't think Pact Boons is the right term, but the Invocations, Eldritch Invocations that bump up the Eldritch Blast, which makes an already overpowered cantrip even more so. What I would really have loved to have seen, honestly, is if what your patron is affects what your Eldritch Blast does. So, for example, with Pact of the Celestial, you can comment on this more in a moment if you'd like, Mara. I know you've played a Pact of the Celestial Warlock. If, for example, it did radiant damage or if it had some sort of ability where every time you land, somebody in your party gets hit points back or, or something like that, rather than just to continuously beef up the damage. Yes, and I very heavily agree with this. The Celestial Warlock especially definitely needs uh, a bit of beef to its subclass. In fact, that is something else I'd like to comment about Warlocks, is that there are two types of subclass for this, despite the fact that there are, I believe, five total subclasses. And the two types are so insanely overpowered that you'll be defeating dragons at level 10 with freaking Eldritch Blast, and the classes which are just actually never used. And as mentioned before, I've played a Celestial Warlock, and while I enjoyed it, we already had, I believe it was, two healers in the group. And realistically, the way how Celestial Warlock's built, it is either that or Eldritch Blast. Those are your only two options with that. And so that, that, and that actually sort of segues on my next bit, which is, all of the good warlock stuff are sort of the uh, the edgy class subclasses and such. Where I I actually wanted to talk about this a little more, and we'll talk about it with paladins too. F for no apparent reason, warlocks are so heavily also based on alignment that it means that not only are you casting eldritch blast, but you're doing it in this very uh, 
You're casting it at civilians nine times out of ten if you're playing this class. Let's just be honest here. Uh, yes, so that is the sort of stereotype of the warlock, and it's interesting because the paladin, it's the opposite. Warlocks are sort of always bad guys, and paladins are always good guys. Now, you do have options in the warlock class. You can do a Pact of the Celestial, which, as you mentioned, is underpowered, and the implication is that since you're doing a, a Pact with an angelic being, you're going to focus more on doing good. Pact of the Fae doesn't necessarily require it be a good Fae. It could be an evil Fae. But realistically, if somebody wants to do evil, they'll do Pact of the Great Old One or uh, Pact of the Fiend. I, I think one thing you could do to sort of mitigate this or, or to, uh, to, to make it work a little bit better, a couple of options. One of them is that if... You would have to talk to your DM about this, but you could have a really interesting campaign where the Warlock is trying to complete one task that will grant the Warlock their power indefinitely from whatever creature this is, good or evil. And that could be really interesting. Another one I have thought about is... Oh, and I, I would be remiss if I failed to mention Impact of the Great Old One. It does mention that it's possible that you could be drawing off of the power of some great old entity like Hadar or, or something else from the Far Realms without it quite realizing what you're doing. And if you work that into a campaign, that could be really interesting because you would then have a situation where your, your party is sort of living in fear of the entity that your warlock is drawing power off of, noticing them. And I could really see some interesting sort of deception and stealth and all of that kind of stuff going on and and definitely kind of some double blind stuff going on where your warlock has to deceive the local authorities as to where they're getting their power from because nobody's going to be enthusiastic about you drawing attention of cthulhu to your local town <laughs> and then also you're trying to hide it from you know cultists or whoever else in addition, though, you know, we were talking the other day about Kenku and lizard folk and some of the problems with, with them as, as uh, playable races. I could actually see a really interesting storyline where you have a lizard folk that has agreed to a pact, but maybe not quite understood what they were agreeing to. So there would be this, this constant tension and conflict of the lizard folk trying to fulfill its contract and increasingly not being comfortable doing so. Yes. And uh, just due to the length of the video, we should probably move on to paladins. But the last thing I'll really say about warlocks for the moment is also just don't... If your DM... And this is uh, the fault of Wizards of the Coast, too. If your DM says you cannot play a lawful good warlock, they are wrong. It says nowhere in the class description that. It just heavily implies that it's unlikely. And, again... I very much dislike Warlocks because that's what they did to the Paladin, too, is they heavily implied, if not outright, say that they have to uphold certain ideals. Uh, so that that needs that just needs to be fixed. While, while we can provide some small solutions like n not letting the DM rule that, there's only so much you can do there. And so I think on a, on the greater game level, that actually does need fixing. But uh, moving on to... Paladins, though, actually, I'm going to expand upon the last po the point I made second to last about the Warlock, which was their ideology and their alignment, which alignment's broken. We'll probably do a video on it later on. But basing an entire class off of an alignment is problematic. And while Warlock does not specifically say you have to be evil, this is actually in the Paladin description. A paladin swears to uphold justice and righteousness, to stand with the good things of the world against the encroaching darkness, and to hunt the forces of evil. What do we do with this? <laughs> yes, and so that's why paladins have a reputation for being the most boring class in terms of how they're played, because the paladin is always the sort of bully trying to force the party to go along with, with what they do. And... Some of this does come down to, to players. It, uh, a, a comparison I would make would be the person who plays a rogue who keeps stealing from the party and or killing party members in the, their sleep. Saying it's what my character would do would only go so far. Uh, how to be a great game master 
channel did a good video on this. He called it Chaotic Stupid about the, the rogue who, just because they can, continuously derails the adventure. Also, just side note that's not necessarily related to Paladin, Rogue, Warlock, anything really. If someone says that they... It's, it's within their character to do something incredibly stupid that could get the party killed. I would love to point out that as long as you're not playing a, lo a lawful character, you are completely within your right to kill the other person or at least do some damage to them if they're about to kill you. So, yes, so there is that aspect of it as players don't always rein it in. Now, I'm going to give uh, some real credit to Wizards of the Coast with, it, with this. On Xanatar's Guide to Everything, they did... One of the one of the they did two subclasses for the paladin. One of them is the oath of conquest, and the other one is the oath of redemption. The oath of redemption is something you should never ever ever play. <laughs> it's basically a, a a watered down cleric. I get what they were going. They were going for a pacifist character, but it's just really hard to make that fun. Oath of conquest though is an interesting one because it's a paladin that is dedicated to to sheer military might they can be good but it even does mention in the description that there's a, a subset of these guys called hell knights who have actually turned evil they've turned evil but they're not broken with paladin so it, it does create a, a venue for an for an evil paladin the tenets of conquest are douse the flame of hope it's not nearly enough it's not Enough to merely defeat an enemy in battle. Your victory must be so overwhelming that your enemy's will to fight is shattered. A blade can end a life. Fear can end an empire. Rule with an iron fist. Once you have conquered, tolerate no dissent. Your word is law. Those who obey it shall be favored. Those who defy it shall be punished as an example to all who might follow. Strength above all. You shall rule until a stronger one arises. Then you must grow mightier to meet the challenge or fall to your own ruin. I played, actually one of my favorite characters I've ever played was a half-work Oath of Conquest paladin. And the way I played him was that he had uh, he'd been raised in a traditional orcish society where they were just sort of raiding and marauding. And he came to his oath by sort of realizing all we're really doing is murdering farmers and then having to run away when organized armies show up. So he just wanted something a little bit more. And that was a situation where he didn't necessarily quite understand what he was getting into at the time where he took his oath. And so he, you had this character who was a very, in combat, was very orderly, lawful, aligned, and organized. And in the rest of his life was a walking stereotype of an orc, basically drinking and humping his way through the fantasy world. <laughs> the, he eventually came to a town where the only brothel was a temple to a love goddess, and he had to swear fealty to her in order to hire their services, which then angered his god, so it, it wound up turning into a kill god campaign. <laughs> and I gotta say, you know, we're, we're running a little bit short on time here, so we, we'll need to wind it down soon before I before I hand it off to Mara. Something I'd like to point out about both of these classes that gets so overlooked, both of them rely heavily on charisma as, an, as their modifier ability for spellcasting. You don't have to use charisma the same way every time. I don't necessarily want to encourage a sort of stereotypical bard paladin who's using their charm to, to sort of seduce their way through the land, but it actually, you know what, I'm wrong. I am encouraging that because it could be hilarious. You know, you have this noble knight who upholds all these tenants who is leaving this, this, this string of bastards in his wake uh, of various... Uh, various you know half races and stuff throughout the land and actually with the oath of the ancients paladin it makes a lot of sense because they are not dedicated to a sort of traditional like a, a catholic type hierarchy they're they're dedicated more to the fae to nature so that could work out really well and there again it could be some really interesting things to do for either a paladin or a warlock a warlock would have the same charisma based ability and it gives you a role play element of the character outside of you know Eldritch Blast, Divine Smite, or whatever. Yes, well, and the the last thing I'll really leave you with, if you're having trouble figuring out what to do with the Paladin's alignment, is to point out two major factors of evil. The first is the fact that 
Evil is completely relative, nine times out of the out of ten. Today, I'd be chaotic good. I pay, uh, I pay my income tax, I do everything I'm supposed to. If it was 1936 Germany, I would be chaotic evil because I'd be attacking every single Nazi on site. Uh, so that is an, a very important thing to remember is that and also, the way how DM, most DMs will rule it, if they're smart, is they'll rule that evil is how many negative actions and how many people you hurt versus how many people you help. So you can have a good paladin who still hurts a lot of people, and you can have a bad paladin who helps people. But the truly the last... And also, I will mention that Zariel, the demon lord, is actually chaotic neutral. Uh, fun fact, uh, because she's actually helped a lot of people as well. But the last thing that I really want to leave it with here is a quote from Geralt of Rivia from The Witcher 3. Evil is evil. Lesser, greater, middling. It makes no difference. The degree is arbitrary and the definition is blurred. And uh, if you liked this, please leave a like and subscribe. We'll be covering more issues with D&D &D and Grand Strategy in the future. And we always, YouTubers always say, comment, like, share, subscribe. Genuinely, if you, I'd, I'd love to read about some interesting Paladin and Warlock adventures and how you made those characters interesting. So by all means, if nothing else, comment. We want to hear your story.